Hey everybody, what's up? There was some debate about whether or not we should go live today because of all that's going on in the world. And we thought if you're feeling in a place of hopelessness and you're not sure what to do and you're just looking for some answers, especially as it surrounds your business, as all of this stuff with COVID and the riots and the looting that's going on right now, I just could not think of a better person to have on the show at this moment in time. She's gone through so many different things and she has got a lot to share. So in today's show, today's show, we're going to talk about how to grow, build, and scale your business from idea to acquisition. But before we tell you how to do that, because that's a big thing that we're going to be talking about today, I have a little bit of a backstory. And the backstory is how I met my guests. A few years back, I was producing and directing um, some interview documentary videos for LinkedIn. And they introduced me to this person. And I was chatting with her. And she had, at this point in time in her life, already sold her company for millions of dollars, made more money than she knew what to do with. So I asked her, naturally, why do you still work? And she told me something. She said, and I hope she remembers this because it has an impact on my life. She said, "This Chris is going to sound really corny, but I try to do something so that I can earn a note, a little message a message of gratitude from somebody in the world where they can say, thank you for helping me. And that really hit me. And I've been thinking about that for some time. And I didn't know it at that time, but it set me off on a course and a direction. And I have to say, the reason, one of the big reasons why I do what I do today with you guys is because I too now want that same note. Didn't get it right away, but I'm here. And that's why I think it's really important to have this conversation with Beata Shalette. Now, I want to teach you guys something. And I think we're going to try to go real meta here. So I'm going to talk about this thing, about being an attractive character. Everybody wants to know, how do I develop my personal brand? How do I tell my story? Well, Russell Brunson wrote this book called Dotcom Secrets. And he talked about being an attractive character it has nothing to do with the way you look. But it has these four traits, these four traits that are really, really important. You have to have a compelling backstory, one that's tied to what it is that you do today. We all have these stories to tell. Two is you have to have some character flaws. Nobody likes a perfect person, and they can identify with you and see themselves in you in a way. And through your life and your experiences, you're going to come back with these anecdotes or parables, these lessons that you've learned through hard experience that you want to share to ease the pain of others. And you have to take a side. And taking a side means you're going to risk alienating some people. You might actually be polarizing. Now, this is his formula. And he talks about this in the storylines that you can use. So here we go. This is interesting because typically a person has one of these storylines. But my guest, Biate, has all of them. So we're going to do this in a weird way today. I'm going to prompt her to talk about her story of loss and redemption, the us versus them, the before and after, because that's the transformation, the amazing discovery that she had, and her secret telling. And she has many secrets that she's going to share, things that she's developed. Maybe we'll leave the uh, the personal test uh, personal testimonial, I see there's a typo there, out of it. But at least we're going to dip into these five things, and we're going to share some things with you. And it's not just me saying this, and I'm very enthusiastic to, to have her and welcome her on in about 10 seconds, but Huffington Post, one of the must 50, 50 must-follow women entrepreneurs. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Beate Chalette. You guys, please help me welcome Beate. Beate, how are you doing? Woo! Woo! I'm blushing with this introduction. I had no idea that this was what resonated with you, but... Yes, I have a box of cards and thank you notes. And mm -hmm. this is the blood, you know, that runs in the veins of we just made an impact. And I'm sure you got a box by now yourself. I do. It's a virtual box, but there's a box there. I screen capture the notes because <laughs> anytime I ever feel like a little bit discouraged by somebody, I just read one of these things and it lifts me up mm -hmm. and I'm in the clouds for days. Uh, there's something else that you did uh, with me yes. and you told me, Chris, because you were telling me at that time uh, that you were getting paid to do public speaking. I was like, I'd like to do that someday. And you said, build an audience, build an audience and a community. And you said, here's how I'm doing it. You went over the high level stuff. And 
that got my brain and my eyes trained on something and and here we are so can we just dive into your story really briefly i know you've talked about it at length to many different people so the story of loss and redemption now just picking up the little parts here uh, you're a single mom at this point in time in your story one of your former employees tried to steal literally steal your business from you by going towards another client you got into a lawsuit and then you got into debt tell me more about this Yes. So this is the story that you read about that happens to other people. Mm -hmm. And then one day it happens to you. And so Mm -hmm. this is the, you know, the gut feeling. You wake up one day and you go, something is not right and you can't figure out what it is. Next thing you know, clients are not calling you, invoices are not getting paid. And you find out that there's a full blown conspiracy of, you know, two people, key vendor, key uh, employee, coming up with an idea on how to build their business, which is your business just without you. Mm. And in the process, you lose the clients because the clients are mad at you for calling them out for not paying you, but paying, you know, paying, paying the bad guys. And then I get involved in this crazy lawsuit because <laughs> at that point, I still was under the impression I needed to be right about everything. Yeah. So uh, I'm involved in this, in this, <laughs> you know, exactly what I'm talking about, I right? Do. You know, we I all do. have that. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, but I was wrong. But I, I was wrong and I need to be right. And so I'm getting into this lawsuit and I'm going in, you know, pretty deep into into the expenses that it takes to fight uh, to right a wrong. And right. as I'm going deep into debt, I really lose this side of the business of photography representation business. And I had about a half a million dollars worth of production scheduled on the books and I was working with great clients Wrangler Levi's BMW I'm thinking you know fall's coming around everybody's coming to Los Angeles we're going to be producing shoot after shoot after shoot September 11th comes mm. and in one day in 24 hours I am losing my entire business on top of the other part I already had just lost and I you know the lawsuit settled it settled for nothing um because I had to pay a lot of debt. But at the time I had this idea and I, you know, talk about, and I think this is important for your audience to hear. Okay. Oh, shoot. Okay, guys, hang tight for a second. Uh, We're having some internet issues here. Everything was going so smoothly up until right now. And I, I have more questions I know, to ask Beate. Right? I, I really do. So Jonah, you're going to send Beate a link to Zoom. Is okay. that right? Yes, I'm going um, okay. to see that I can. And um, while you're doing that, I'm going to keep right the people now. entertained. Yes, Zoom link. So Jonah, I have, so, I have to also yes, switch? Yes, okay, okay do yeah. that. Just stay here? Okay, stay here with audio. Okay, I'm gonna do this. So, guys, give us three minutes. It's it's gonna be really quick. And there's something that Beate talked about that I I need to highlight for you, is that sometimes you lose by winning. That she said that she felt so wrong that she needed to right that wrong, and she gets into a lawsuit. And I know that we've talked about this in in a couple of segments here and there, but there's a good chance that you probably have not heard me talk about this. So I want to make it really clear. And this is a ve- very valuable lesson that I learned from my business coach, whom, whom I've had for many, many years. And he told me, you got to just get the job done. That sometimes your pursuit of being right and righting that wrong, it could be the end of you. And it almost was the end of Beate because she had spent so much of her time, her energy and money. And even though she was victorious, I think that she didn't get any money for, from it. And she spent a ton of money in legal fees. And that's the price of being right sometimes. Okay, we see that uh, our friends Van Cooley is here. Okay, I'm trying. And Annalie, I think. Okay, now we can hear you again. Okay, I'm trying to get into Zoom. Yes. All right, it's not connecting me quite yet. All right, hang tight, it's, everybody. Uh, I'm looking at the, the spiral. Okay, here we go. Okay, and... So we're only using. Am the I other going one for to video. Uh, stop the other browser? Am I getting out of it? Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So I'm good. We're good, Jonah. Audio, video. Okay. Wow! Look at that. We're back. We're back. Okay. We're everybody's making do with what what's going on. Okay. So let's get back into it. So you're. I, I think at 
some point here with all the stuff that's going on and it seems like life is conspiring to take you down Beate and you're like $100,000 in debt and you do something quite remarkable. What do you do next? I wrote a letter to the president of the United States. <laughs> Why not? Wait, we have to spend a minute so here. We have to spend a minute here. Okay, I've been in trouble in my life. I, I would reach out to my parents. I would reach out to my brother, my uncles, my aunts. Uh, I would reach out to a mentor. Why did you reach out to the president of the United States? Okay, so here's the real version, okay? Okay. So my former mother-in-law okay. just would not shut up about it. She kept saying, he's your president. He's the president of the people. You need to write the president. If anybody, he can help you. And, I'm, and I finally wrote that letter just so we would not have to talk about this anymore. And I could say, <laughs> fine. I wrote the president of the United States to please help me. Mm -hmm. And then I let it go. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> So she's, and, she's just nagging you the whole time, like, right? She's you, nagging yeah, me. Yeah. So you didn't nagging just get me. her off your back. Just I like, get her off my back. I did it. Okay. How was it? Did you write the most amazing letter ever? Well, I just basically said that um, you always talk about the small business being the backbone of the American economy. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, giving you a real life opportunity to prove that what you say is true. Ooh. That, um, that, you know, I've, I've, I've done everything right. I came here as an immigrant. I worked my butt off. I'm legal. I, you know, I, I have a child. I'm a, I'm a mother. I'm raising her. I'm doing right. I don't lie. I don't steal. I work hard. You know, I help people. I, I do my job and I don't know what else to do. And that's it. And then I let it go. Mm. So Just you like probably that. were not and expecting any kind of response, right? Not really. I mean, you know, who thinks that they're going to get a letter from the White House until you get the letter from the White House. Right. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> and then, take, take and then in the letter though. from the White yeah. House. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in that, you know, and, and in the meantime, and then I forgot, and there's like a couple months that go by, and right. in these couple months, my father dies. Oh. In Germany. And I'm, you know, now I'm really out cold because now I've, you know, I'm deep into debt. My best friend, my mentor, my advisor uh, has passed away. I'm in mm -hmm. Germany on this beautiful mountain with this Baroque church and we just had buried him. My phone rings. It's my office in Los Angeles. And they say, we've just been served a notice and we are now losing the house. Oh my that gosh. I, you know, that I rented. Yeah. But it was like that slum landlord that had to find a reason to get me out. So I come back, I have to find a place to move. Uh, on money I don't have, pay for a funeral on money I don't have, figure out what am I going to do with all of this, and then I get a letter from the White House. Okay. And can you tell me, just, I, I need to slow your story down. I, I've heard it so many times, but I need to slow it down because I want to savor every little juicy detail here. Are you holding this letter in your hand and you're like, wait, from the president of the United States? I mean... How does this? I don't, I've never received anything. I don't know anybody that's ever received correspondence from the president. What does this look like, and how do you feel before you even open it? Well, I mean, you get the letter, and yeah. it says the White House, mm -hmm. and then you usually have this like one word that comes immediately to mind that I probably shouldn't say out loud, <laughs> and then you go like, and then what you does open it, rhyme it with? and it says a, <laughs> yeah. Luck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're like, oh, luck. Okay, you open it. And then what oh, happens? Oh, luck. Exactly. Oh, That's luck. what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, yeah. oh, luck. And I open right. the letter and it yeah. says the president is delighted to hear from you. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm laughing, you know, yeah. because I'm like, yeah, sure. Right. I'm sure you never even read the letter. Mm -hmm. What it did do is that because I wrote this letter, it was forwarded to the deputy chief director of the small business administration in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not in some, you know, lender uh, or some employee. I'm talking to like the second guy in command for the small business administration in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I walk in with my portfolio. I walk in with my um, business plan. And I sit down and he says, I'm going to put in what you're going to put in. And I knew I was going to be okay. Wait, wait, what does that mean? He's going to put in what you're going to put in. That's the point. 
Well, this is sort of one of the things I believe that a lot of creatives often often overlook. It's that we are in the habit of believing that we wait for the ship. But for you, for your ship to come in, you're going to have to do a lot of preparation. Mm-hmm. Like you got to train, you got to work out, you got to get your stuff in place, you got to pack your suitcase, you got to decide what you're going to take with you. You have to have a plan. You, you need to know where your ship even want to go so that when that ship comes, you actually recognize this is your ship. Yeah. And so I knew what I wanted and I knew where I wanted to sail. And at that moment, I knew I needed the money to free up. Oh, no. Did we just lose audio, first Jonah? contract with Getty Images, no less. Mm-hmm. You knew. Sorry about that. I said that I knew that if, if, if he said oh, I had done all the preparation yeah. to no way again. Yeah, Again, it's almost I, like maybe it's, it's so secret. important that I have to say it like three <laughs> times. Okay, so the secret okay. is yes, you got to be ready when mm. the ship comes in. So that way you recognize the ship, not the barge, not the tanker, not the oil tanker, not the cruise ship, but your catamaran, the one that mm. you want to jump on. Mm-hmm. You need to know which boat it is. Mm-hmm. And I jumped on the boat. Okay. I have to th- think that if you don't meet this SBA person, your life goes in a different direction, right? I would have been bankrupt. No question. You would question. have been bankrupt. Okay. Did he teach you something yes. that you you were like, okay, I, I thought I did it all right. And these are a couple of the things that I learned by talking to this person that set me on that ship that I needed to get onto. Yes, um, he he definitely taught me Lorenzo Flores, deputy chief director of the SBA, now retired, taught me that all this time you spend on your mission, your vision, and all this fancy stuff that goes into a business plan is absolutely useless when you go to the bank because the bank wants to see one and one thing only, your numbers and how you're going to pay the money back. Mm-hmm. That's it. Okay. So what does that mean? Like, because uh, I've heard you say this before. Because too many people spend the energy on the things that other people don't care about. Well, so so I think for creatives, it's mm-hmm. really easy to go into that mindset of, I'm here for a purpose. I want people to recognize me for my talent. I want people to see me for who I am. Why don't they get it on how good I am if they only would give me a chance? Um, And then of explaining why they do what they do instead of connecting with the market and having the market tell you what it is that you should be Mm -hmm. because that's what people actually want to buy and being ready in in this element of commerce and business support because people want to know how you help them to be better at their stuff, to sell more, to provide a better customer experience. That's what we do. We're here to help other people to be better, to show their brilliance. We help other, we facilitate other people to step into their brilliance. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that if you take yourself out and you focus it on what other people need from you to actually perform better. And when Mm -hmm. you do that, when you shift that, and that's what I learned from him, it didn't matter. It only mattered what the business plan needed to say that he wanted to have. Right. They gave him the ammunition to go to battle for me. Yes. Okay, I want to say this for our audience, guys. Hang in there. Uh, Beate is in a little bit of a, a home war zone. There's construction going on. There's a whole bunch of things going on. So we're just making the best with what we have. And and I can hear you clearly most of the time. But what you had said, and I just want to repeat in case people can't hear clearly. Let's just do this, okay? 
that we sometimes focus too much on ourselves and what we want and what we think is important. And when you finally understand that the person on the other side who's making the decisions, whether or not to help you or not, to, to hire you, to give you the project, you have to zone in on what they care about and design it that way. So when when uh, this um, deputy director told you that the banks really just care about how you make money or where the money is going, did that make you look at your numbers and your business in a different way in preparation for that meeting? Yes, absolutely. And that's really a message I have for everybody. You got to know your numbers, no matter how bad, brutal, or or uninspiring they might be. Right. But the only way for you to change your direction is to know where your starting point is. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a starting point, then you can't map out a path to anywhere because then you, you are at a zero. And a zero mm -hmm. kind of is like nothing. Nothing. Okay. Uh, now, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about your uh, this idea of... Uh, the five star success blueprint. So I'm going to prompt you and then you tell us a little bit about it. Is that okay? Yes, please. Go okay, ahead. here we go. So the first part is to turn your talent into a business. And this is really critical. And I, I could see how clearly you've thought this through because it so resonates with me how to transform your passion into profits. Can you explain that? Yes. So the first thing is um, in, in turning your talent into a business where we have to um, look at what you're really passionate about, what your differentiation factor is, who would want to buy it if there's a market for it, and then what the airtight avatar is that, pardon me, the airtight avatar is that is attracted to this particular uh, product or service. So many times in this in this part of the process, what I see is that somebody says, I can sell X and X and X and X. Oh, and I can do X and X and X. And the buyer is a man, a woman. They could be young or old. They could be here or somewhere else. <laughs> and then it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping right. something sticks. It sounds like you've talked to a lot of creative people. And so that's what... I talk to a lot of creative people yeah. and, you know, I think my favorite quote ever was when I did a, a life event and then one woman said to me that she felt that her work was like the pearl in the oyster. And I blurted out, good luck waiting for the diver. Wow. You know, this does not help. You cannot assume that you're so special mm -hmm. and so amazing that somebody who gets a thousand emails a day is in, bombarded with meetings, Zoom meetings with quotas, 90 day dashes and initiatives and performance reviews that they even give that a second thought to try to go diving for oysters. Mm -hmm. If you don't present them these oysters on a silver platter and say, here's our platinum oyster, here's our gold oyster and here's our silver oyster you're never going to make it ever mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. what we do in this first part we 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 really put the business model in play mm -hmm. excellent and and part of this what i'm hearing from you is you must be super hyper focused and you must be able to reach out and find who it is that you're looking for because otherwise you're trying to catch everybody and you get nobody exactly Exactly. And this is something you you continuously have to adjust on. But, you know, you need to have a basic model like, you know, I, I what I usually see and maybe maybe your audience, Chris, will find this helpful. Is that oftentimes we have a tendency to look to be better at something that. That this overcoming what we think is a deficiency will make us how brilliant we are. Mm -hmm. And we forget that the stuff that we are innately good at, the stuff that is so easy for us that we can't believe other people are don't even know how to do that. Right. That's what we need to sell. You need to double down on that and forget all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you teach this. I mean, I do. I'm I do. But people don't always, it. people always don't believe me. So I like to bring on other people to smack them in the head and tell them the same thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jonah, is there a problem? You're, you're like, 
yes, we have. Okay. Yes. So we need to lower the quality so that we can hear. The most important thing is to be able to hear Beate clearly. Everything else is can take a second seat, Jonna. So if you have to cut to me or my slide or something, just make sure we can hear her clearly. So guys, hang in there. There's some really valuable stuff. And if we can't figure this internet thing out, we may just call an audible and postpone this until you have a hardwired connection or something where we can see and hear you. Go ahead, Jonna. I am hardwired. That's the problem. OK, yeah. do you want me to go to 2.5? Okay. Okay. Mm, okay. Okay. All right. This is a an opportunity for a better internet service provider to help out here. Oh Jesus! And right. It's been okay. It's... So let's hope this is better. Yes. So far, so good. All right. Okay. Jonah, we, we... All right. Okay, cool. All right, all right. So finding focus uh, and, and creative people, especially just they they like variety. They they want to do something new all the time, and they think everything that they do somebody could use. And so they're they're always scrambling, and they lose focus, and they're not not able to get that expert um, authority status. So let's let's move on to point number two. Point number two is this: is in in your plan your five-step plan, how to sell more and feel good about it. This is about closing higher sales through value-driven packages. This makes total sense to me. Please explain more. Yes. And yeah, so this is a very simple principle. So mm -hmm. oftentimes we get into the uh, time versus money comparison. Yes. And in, in this comparison, you always lose. So the objective is to say, how do I put the price in comparison with something else that uh, will make it clear to the buyer where the value is? So value-based means you get away from saying, I show up on time, I deliver, uh, I deliver a high-resolution image, I, uh, I do uh, follow you know, the, the best practices, I have done my continuous education, and look at it from what the client wants. So I give you an example. So when you hire a housekeeper, so you are tempted to look at, well, how much do you charge for a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment? Right. And then you look at the price and then you hire the person who's cheapest. But what if one, one of the housekeepers comes in and says, well, uh, my people are, are, are verified, background checked. If we break something, we have insurance, we'll replace it, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. We have a white glove service. Um, we, you know, we, we make sure that we do a walkthrough with you before. We take a video the first time we come into the house to make sure that we, we take stake. And suddenly, if they charge twice as much, the value that they offer is so much more than somebody who's just coming in and cleaning the floors. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about what the value-based package is you bring to the table. Mm-hmm. I love that because actually that's an experience that I can relate to because the cleaning services for our building, when we're interviewing different cleaners, one would present very differently, mostly based on price and measurements. The other person came in and talked about their cleaning equipment, the the um, low VOC chemicals that they use and the HEPA filters and everything that they do and the rules that they train everybody, touch this, don't touch this, and they follow very strict protocols. And they, they also name other clients that they work with, which you know have very high standards. So they're, they're using that kind of referral to establish authority, the social proof, if you will. I love that, that you're exactly. able to break it down. And the object, and the, the, yeah, and the learning, the learning part here really is that people don't always buy on price, they buy on value. Mm -hmm. And what is some of the biggest drivers on perceived value? It has to be something that they want and it needs to be in relationship to something else. So if I buy a diamond ring mm -hmm. and I look at the diamond ring and I say the diamond ring is $2,000 and then I see another diamond ring and that is $20,000 and I see one that's, let's say, $250, how do I put that in relationship to the buyer? So they have to educate me. They have to say, well, this is flawless. This is cut a specific way. This is a, a very rare diamond, the size of the diamond. This is, um, you know, this diamond is 
you know, is, is, is much smaller. It's not as well cut. There's flaws. Mm -hmm. For my opinion in pricing based upon the information I'm getting. So when you walk away from trying to sell into trying to educate to help them make up their mind, it's 10 times easier to make a sale. Mm -hmm. Great. I love that. Okay. So let's get into step three and the audio is holding together for us. Let's, let's hope and fingers crossed that we can keep doing that. So here's part number three, authority platform building. Become the leader in your industry and a recognized authority in your field. What does that mean? Yes, it means that this is what most people try to do first. And then they wonder why their business never takes off. So they go on social media, they're, you know, taking all kinds of positions and it's not in accordance or it's not narrowed down to what supports the business model and the sales model. So, you know, again, an example, while I like Instagram, but it just doesn't really work for me as well as LinkedIn does right. or as uh, Facebook does. So, uh, and you know, now increasingly so YouTube. So I had to focus on what my authority building platform is, which is ideally where my audience is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people make a mistake that when they do authority platform building, that they go like, oh gosh, I gotta do Pinterest. I gotta do YouTube. I gotta do LinkedIn. I gotta do Facebook. I gotta do Instagram. I gotta do TikTok. I gotta do Snapchat. <laughs> I gotta do all these different things. I have to have the chat bot. I have to have the, uh, you know, and, and it's just like, your mind just explodes. <laughs> Yes, because you are not focused. Mm. So now in authority platform building, you actually need to figure out how are you going to be building your authority platform on a platform that's natural and uh, fun for you that you can do consistently and where actually your clients are. Yeah. And I have to say, you were pretty early on. I, I don't want to just say this, but I think you were a pioneer on LinkedIn because you were on LinkedIn before it was cool to be on LinkedIn, before Microsoft bought it, before anybody was using it for anything. And you built a community. And those little, that's one of the things you told me, Chris, go do this. And then I poked around in yours. I'm like, how do I do this? It took me probably a little over two years to figure it out. But eventually I got there. Like I said, I'm a late bloomer. And this is the thing. Every young designer out there, they run around thinking, I got to be on the latest platform. And they have even mastered one and they're moving on to the next, right? Right now, TikTok is all the rage. And I, I catch a lot of flack on social media because yet another platform me to try to figure out. I, I, I'm, I'm exhausted as it is. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. And this is really part of what you had said earlier is mm -hmm. about being unapologetic about it. Mm -hmm. and to uh, be controversial and to double down on the stuff that you're good at. Uh, at this point, frankly, you know, I don't have to be liked by everybody anymore. Right. And if you disagree with me, that's great. I love a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking for people whom I can help, not people who I need to convince. Mm. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. So go where you don't have to convince people Go where you find people that want to agree with you. Hmm. I like that. Really do. Okay. Well, you know what? There's the storyline is us versus them and also being for somebody and maybe not right for everybody. So let's take you to the fourth step here, which is the women's code. And you talk about how to cope, collaborate, and lead in your career and your personal life because women have different needs than men. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the super skill and and something that you've uh, I believe is a, a proprietary idea. This ego rhythm. Can you talk about that? Yes. So what I have learned in my life is that when you obsess over something and then you just want it to go away, you go, dear God, dear God, dear spirit, dear universe, dear whatever, mm -hmm. please help me to get through this. And then you get through this and you go like, yay, I mastered this. Boom. There's the next thing. And then you master that and then boom, there comes the next thing. And so I looked at this and I said, well, most people think that life's sort of like a straight line from here to somewhere and they're always trying to get somewhere. But if I look at life um, really like a loaf of bread and then I take a bread knife and I cut it into slices. So if you've ever been to Paris and you walk by a patisserie, 
you smell the bread, you want to go in, you want to stuff the whole thing in your mouth, and that is great. <laughs> However, it is much more appropriate if you might have a, a slice here yep. and a slice here. So you can't have the whole thing. Mm. It's almost like you followed me around Paris and, one time. <laughs> and so, well, I mean, who can resist, right? And then yeah. a little butter and a glass of yeah. bottle, and, and boom, you know, you're hooked uh, mm -hmm. in Paris. But the objective here is to say, if you really want everything in life, which kind of most people do, they want the money, the recognition, they want to make an impact, they want to be, um, they want to have family, they want to have friends, they want to have a relationship, they want to have a, um, you know, they want to have material things, they want to go on great, great trips. So people generally want like a lot of different things and then they have a baby and then they realize that their adventure travel and jumping out of airplanes might not be such a great idea when you have a toddler at home who really needs you. Right. So we we get so boggled down by these, oh, no, my life is over as I know it, drama, versus to say, oh, it's just a rhythm. That's why I call it ego rhythm, my own rhythm. It's only a slice of my bread in the period of time I'm here. And just like this, I can recreate this again and again and again and again at a different time. Why does it have to be all at once? So that's the concept of ego rhythm. Mm -hmm. And the second step with that was, is that after I sold my business to this Bill Gates company, to Corbis, they brought me on as the global director of entertainment. And I saw how bad it is in leadership for women and minority and how this whole system is structurally and systematically set up, which is why we have riots to discriminate and not work for anybody who is not a white male and mm -hmm. programmed to function in the system. So I had this idea that if there is a men's code, then maybe... It is the women's code that we need to balance it because if ah, we have, yeah. and I call this a continuum, right? Mm -hmm. A sliding scale of leadership. If I understand the male side of leadership and understand that there's a female side of leadership, which is what we're seeing now with COVID, right? In a pandemic is that empathy, collaboration, teams coming together, safety. These are all female centric attributes. So the leader now needs to step up and say, well, what's the female side of this that I need to draw from? Because winning in competition isn't going to get anywhere when we have a disaster. It's this compassionate connection with other people. So that's why I founded the Women's Code to show to the world in leadership, and this doesn't matter if you run a company of one or a company of 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 people, is you need to understand that your idea might only be half of it. So learn the other side and learn how to use that. Mm, okay. So I have to ask you this question. I have to ask you this question since it, the, the word is in there, the women's code and the book, uh, Happy Woman, Happy World. Do you specifically target or just say this, what I'm teaching is mostly for women? Are these ideas that men can learn from women or these feminine ideas to help us be better leaders, managers, partners, whatever? Well, aren't you like ever so subtly like walking right into the big question of my life? Um, <laughs> so this is really, this is a learning that I've been going through. This is my learning in the pandemic that I've just arrived at. So this is brilliant that you picked up on this so quickly. So the lesson I believe that we are all learning right now, and I, I just learned this so I can share this and I hope, mm -hmm. I hope, you know, your audience will find some value in this is we come out swinging because we see something that is not right. That's unjust. And we perceive that as detrimental, contradictory, controversial, and we step in and we raise our fist and we fight. How can companies do this to women? How can companies do this to how can this be happening to the Asian community? How can this be happening to X, Y, Z, race, religion, whatever? And then we get nothing accomplished because we are in friction. 
and friction only creates heat and more friction. So I literally draw controversy and the anger and the frustration and the verbiage about how dare men do something like this to mm -hmm. women, like literally like a month ago. Right. And I said, that's not who I want to be anymore because I want to teach. So to answer your question, I want to teach that what is male leadership? Well, how does it show up and what is female leadership and how does that show up? Because really my goal is not the fight. My goal is gender, gender neutral leadership. That's my goal. So we have to remember that the path is not what we sell. We sell the end result. And then when that finally, you know, after all these fights and YouTube comments and the world will be better without you and feminists, um, you know, and, 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 and you should die. And I, you know, you're such a X, Y, Z. I mean, every word I've been called every name on the planet to receive death threats because I said women should receive equal pay. And then you go and you say, I can't win if I keep fighting a fight that is considered controversial. So how do I go in a back door and turn this around and create something everybody can agree on? So if I say there are male leadership attributes that are important, winning is important, competition is important, loyalty is important, three things that women are generally not that great with. Mm. Compassion, empathy, and community building is super important. Things that men oftentimes are not that great with. Mm -hmm. So why can't we have both? Why can't we, why can't we acknowledge that we need both sides? So this is my project now is to literally change the language, change the branding and, and come at it from a point and say, what do we need to do to have people understand their way is only half, and there's another side. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. So you're coming into this more recently, and and the thing thing the thing that you said is this outrage culture that tends to proliferate on the internet. It's good at stirring emotions and poking the bear, and the bear wakes up. But then we oftentimes see that sometimes it just it's a lot of smoke, and then it just fizzles out. Like we don't know, like all these uh, Occupy Wall Street things that didn't really turn into anything and that you may get more done just by building bridges and understanding and appreciating different energies. Uh, like I, I like to use it, uh, the term like energy versus like male or female. It's, there's ideas and energy that are better and we should be able to step back like at a, like at a buffet and just pick the best parts that make sense to us that we can achieve the goals that we have in our personal and our professional lives. Right. You are, you are absolutely correct. It's the, you know, and, and, and we see this whenever there's a riot. So there is a, a, a theme and then people have a particular type of language, a verbiage that's appropriate for how people should think. And then anybody who says something that is not exactly along this line of the doctrine or the dogma, mm -hmm get slaughtered even people that are on the right on the same side it's like well you as a white woman will never understand what it's like to be a black woman duh right. i could have told you that right but that's not the point mm -hmm. the point is you need me to be your friend and your ally so explain it to me so mm -hmm. that instead of just you fighting the rest of the world and me mm -hmm. we can do this together and maybe i can give you some pointers on how to not come across you know, with so much rage that we can actually get more stuff done. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, the lesson here in what we're seeing right now is where do you want to be? Like, literally, that's my question. Where do you want to be and how do you want to show up? And, and then this, like, being this angry feminist thing, oh, I mean, it's not sexy. It's not uplifting it's not fun i want to have fun i want to inspire people i want to give people hope i want to give i want to give solutions and i can't do that if i'm always fighting so i had to drop the fight and and so in a way you know this has been the blessing for me in in what uh the what the pandemic has brought forward is a, a real change in my attitude like mm -hmm. who do i want to be
Mm -hmm. I, I love this. And I love that we can go through different stages in our life and have an arc and have the wisdom to say that worked for me for a period of time. I'm ready to adopt a different thing. And this is about growth. And I think this is wonderful. Now, some people, unfortunately, hold on to ideas that they've had since their childhood all the way into their grave. And I think that's such a sad, tragic waste of an opportunity to grow and to change. And evolution, evolution is an advantage. It's not a hindrance. It's not something that you have to fight if you don't want to. I also love this message about finding common ground and building a coalition. We are stronger and better together. We need allies on all these things that we're trying to rid the world of. Inequity, environmental damage and harm, everything else that you can think of. We got to work together, people. Okay, part five, step five. Here we go. And I have other questions to ask you, of course, but growth strategies, putting massive growth on autopilot. And I, I guess this is the, the bookend uh, to this, this idea of how to build, to grow, to scale, and possibly to sell your business. And you're one of the few creative people that I know that have actually exactly. done it. So please tell me more about it. I've done it actually twice. Um, really? One, you know, one was my own business. The other one I brokered. Yeah, I brokered the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, again, you know, let's go through this. You built the business model, you know how to sell it, you know how to build your authority. You really step into leadership and get very clear who you are as a leader and what you need to lead. And then, and only then can you blow this thing out of proportion. Mm -hmm. So now we look at automation systems, processes, organizational charts, growth charts. How do we map this out? How do we double, triple, quadruple numbers? And how do we build the, the products, the services, the, um, you know, the equity component of our business to, you know, create this passive income that everybody wants. And this right. is required if you want to sell your business, because without systems and processes, you got nothing to sell. You got mm -hmm. only yourself to sell. Uh -huh. So if you want to sell a business, you need to set it up in such a way that it actually looks and talks and acts like a business. Uh -huh. What you're saying is if the business can only operate with you, it's not a very sellable or scalable business that people need to buy systems, process, clients, uh, proprietary, technology, proprietary technologies, whatever it is that you have. These are the assets that you've created over time that they can then successfully run the business without you because they can't be tied to you. It's a very, um, it's a very risky business to buy if it's dependent on one person, right? Okay. Uh, in case you guys are joining, and gen generally speaking, it doesn't it doesn't sell. Right. It doesn't sell. Now, in case you guys are joining us, you don't know who uh, I have on the show today. Uh, I'm talking to Beate Chalet, and you can find out more information about her at BeateChalet.com and also on social media at Beate Chalet. I do want to mention that you have this book called Happy Woman, Happy World. And somebody who I admire, author Brian Tracy, gave you this quote, and it says, this is an amazing book, a guide and handbook for every woman who wants health, happiness, love, success, and a fulfilling career. Now, having said that, coming back to us a little bit. You all have also done something that I'm still working on. So I'm just trying to catch up to you, Beate. You're a public speaker and you, you get paid to speak. You get paid mm -hmm. for your ideas. You get paid for your opinions. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you built that, where that is pre-COVID? Because I know everything's changed now, but prior to that. Yes. So um, speaking is really part of a um, the authority platform building portion of my business. So I, um, you know, and there are like nonprofit organizations, you generally tend to not really get paid unless you are a celebrity in the keynote. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a big event, a fundraising event, and they need a draw. And then um, a lot of the conferences from industry associations also try not to pay you because these portions are when um, you know they, they, they get the guy from Microsoft and the gal from PayPal and the other person from Snapchat and they give him a stage and then in the hopes that then Microsoft, Snapchat and PayPal is going to sponsor this event. So these, these speaking engagements are a little bit harder to, harder to get into. And if you get a slot, it's usually on the second 3.30 in the afternoon when most everybody has left in a breakout room uh, where you then have to 
run through the hallways and try to usher people into the room. So, but you know, if you if you pay your dues and you get a good slot, it's phenomenal because you are in the room with the same. You know, you're in in room with very powerful people, and they there's a chance to hear you speak. Mm-hmm. The stuff that really pays is when you do corporate events, and when you do when these ideas that you know people have heard you at these other events then say well my company needs to hear that and then they bring you in uh to do something so i did um i did a great gig that i loved for johnson and johnson's uh, uh arm jansen which is the pharmaceutical arm of johnson and johnson that is working on the covid-19 treatment and vaccine and the uh, one of the, the gentlemen that, that called me in, you know, he has a research and development team of uh, about 200 people sitting all over the world. And he said, I need you to get the message across that they have what they need to have. They have all the tools available that they could possibly. I picked and, you know, the, your audience can relate to that. I picked the example of the writer room to uh, to demonstrate that in a writer room there is no right or wrong because the idea could lead to the idea Mm. that leads to the the overall you know arc of the story that then brings it all together so in a writer room you can't have an ego because you have individual character development you have relationship character development you have story development over one episode over the whole series over the whole season uh, over all seasons, right? It has to be a progression. So when you look at it this way, and so I brought that in. So these are the gigs that pay. That's mm-hmm. that's where the money is, is to go into corporations, but they have to see you somewhere. Mm-hmm. And now I, I think I either read this or heard you say this, that writing a book is almost a necessity if you want to be taken seriously as a public speaker, because that establishes your authority. Is that true? Or do you feel differently? Mm-hmm. No, yeah, that's absolutely true. Without a book, you you get five hundred dollar gigs. That's hardly, hardly the stuff. Uh, right. My heart is made out of. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I want to be properly compensated, and I know you talk about compensation all the time. So yeah, without a book, uh, and and don't make it like one of those cheesy books that looks like you self published it. At least put some work in it, and make it make it you know have a good writer and and. Uh, you know, and, and and try to make it a book that you can actually be proud of and read in three years and still a good book. I spent about a year writing this book. We still self-published. Actually, I, I founded the publishing company with two partners together to publish it. And then, um, you know, that was a really, really idiotic idea to do that. But, you know, I <laughs> at least own that. And uh, but the book, you know, I sell the book quite a bit directly. And when I speak or you sell the book, when you go on a stage and you say, um, I'm speaking to 100 people at a private event, I will give you a special rate of five dollars per book for your audience. And now mm-hmm. you make extra money Mm -hmm. and you get your message out in the hands of people. So there's other marketing ideas, which, you know, again, goes then in the, in the growth component. How do you really grow your business? This is part of, of that step is how do you utilize these things to get the message out? Mm -hmm. I only have a few more minutes with you at less than five minutes. So I, I want to ask you this question and then we're going to wrap up the show. When I met you, I think it's over four years ago, you had said a couple of things to me kind of off camera about building an audience, building community, how you were able to charge for public speaking, and about this idea that do something that's good and that's generous, that people will write you a thank you note. So that set me up for four years of work and development. Set me up for another four years, will you? What has happened since then? Big ideas or things that you you think are, are helpful that in this moment I'm going to listen to and I'll be working on for the next four years? No pressure, right? None. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. I think that what I what I am I've learned now that mm-hmm. I that is really the most important thing to me is number one is to get very clear what it is that you are actually chasing. Mm-hmm. So I had made my business and my career always my priority because I was a single mom and. I had to kind of prove my value based upon what I did. 
to get my self-esteem and my confidence and my value from what I do. Because if so many people like you, so many people send you thank you notes, then they look, then you, then you feel good about yourself because you, how can you not? Right. But what if you can take that out of yourself and you don't need that? Mm -hmm. What if, what if you, you decide, and this is really the message to be flexible to how it changes. You know, I just got engaged in uh, oh, December congratulations. and I am certainly not a spring. Thank you. And mm -hmm. I'm not a spring chicken. And mm -hmm. I've, so the admitting that I needed someone because I wanted the connection, the human connection, the caring, the intimacy, the relationship, the partner, the, the, the connection, the talking, the, the exploring together, that was a really big step for me where I almost felt I betrayed what I had worked for so hard to mm -hmm. achieve my independence and now i am giving that up and i struggled with that so the message for this part of the journey for me however you know the nuggets that i'll be hearing from you in what like five years yep. are really to look at is that thing that you do that you chase so hard all that you want to chase because the mindset, the mental part now becomes a much bigger issue for me. So I am almost doing exclusively work on mental, uh, mental stuff, mindset stuff on mm -hmm. not willing it to happen, but making it possible by shifting my mindset and allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. So I can have more, I can have a richer experience. It's not just work, but I actually, at long last, don't talk about balance, but maybe actually live it. Mm. Okay, that's a lot for me to process. And I, I and I hope I hope if you guys if you guys like our channel, if you like what we've been able to do here, in in no small part, it's been because this spark and that Beate had with me and it was even a long conversation. So I want to point people to your website uh, at beatechalette.com. I know that you do public speaking, corporate events, one-on-one -on -one training, and you have training courses. Uh, what's the best place for somebody to find out more about you besides this website or is this it? Well, I think that the best, um, you know, I actually have an offer, a gift for the audience. Oh, wow. Who uh, want to check out? I have, you know, like I have an airtight avatar a training that I'll make available for free. I have a balance balance planning tool that only takes like ten minutes, mm -hmm. and you can find it on beatechalette.com forward slash free hyphen gifts, and uh, you're welcome to select one or many or all of them. And the best way to really check out what I do is on my YouTube channel, uh, and I'll uh, send you the link. And, um, you know, and, and just check out on, you know, do a lot of stuff on Facebook as well as, you know, sign up for the list because I always obviously, you know, tell everybody on my list what I'm up to and, and send out invitations and share. But you pretty much got it. I'm, you know, just one Google, you'll find a lot of me out there. Great. So, you guys, be sure to check her out on our YouTube channel. We'll include all of what we just said in the links in the description below so you guys can just look there. Beate, thank you so much for sharing uh, your thoughts and your ideas and just for catching up with me and also putting me on this path. I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Have a great day. Okay, Jonah, let's get us out of here. So guys, uh, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. You guys know we're on this one billion mission to change the lives of a billion people through education. And thank you very much. I am out of here. Jonah, play the music, will you?